That's a you know that's a really tricky question. <laughs> but, but and and I think values based recruitment and, and recruiting people about what in what in reason for what they believe in is important. Uh, and I think that is important not only at the level we're doing it, Helen, in terms of uh, recruiting into the posts uh, in the trust, but I think it's important in the way that we recruit into the training courses. Um, and I do think that uh, we got waylaid at one point about technical competency. And technical competency is clearly really important and we've also wanted to make sure that we have um, particularly nurses of the highest educational standard we can. But in that process, I think we lost um, and we got to a stage where people were not interviewed um, for nursing courses. They weren't interviewed to be doctors anymore. Um, and I think we've got to draw it back right throughout the NHS so that we're looking at it from the point from when we recruit doctors and nurses into training schools, I mean, into medical school, into dental school. Um, and then it's got to be throughout the everything you do so it's not just your values based recruitment it's your values based award systems it's your appraisal it's all of those things um, and it will still remain um, still remain absolutely challenging um, but that if anything we've learned through what's happened has to be something about that doesn't it I think we have to accept that that, you know, is a, in some ways a desperately old-fashioned statement. But, uh, and I can do that now because the NHS is listening, but actually in the, and we, because we work in a highly technical environment, as we should do, we are very evidence-based, we're very outcome-measured, we're absolutely where we should be. But that became lost in it. And if you said the word kindness, people would talk about, would think you're a bit fluffy and odd. Uh, but actually, um, it's because we, we, we lost sight of that, didn't we? Um, and the leadership, if, if um, um, the current government and uh, people talk about the need to change the culture in the NHS and the need to change leadership within the NHS, I actually think that's what they need to be focusing on. I'm not... Am I allowed to say something political? Um, I'm not actually convinced the Secretary of State's quite got it yet. Um, because I don't think um, that they're saying one thing and I don't think they're, they're, um, they're, they're seeing it in reality. Because if they were serious about those things, I think we'd be seeing some different messages come out. Um, and that isn't, uh, that isn't a soft, sentimental stuff. That's important stuff that makes difference to patients. quite happy to take that one to start with. Um, the very reason we're here tonight to listen to Rose is because we respect her views and we actually want to try and get her views into our curriculum. We're going through a process of uh, redesigning our courses over the next 18 months and people in influential positions who, who, who have the views that Rose has are going to be key to that, uh, that process. We, in this faculty, and indeed in every faculty of health, rely extremely heavily on our clinical partners to deliver our education. Our, our nurses and midwives spend 50% of their time in placement. We can't do this without them. And if there's a sea change out there, then we have to reflect that. And in many ways, we actually have to lead it, which is why I think it's really important that we have events like this to show that we're reflecting on our practice is, is going to end up reflecting the practice that, that takes place in, in the hospitals. And I agree with the point uh, that you made, that, that kindness and caring is not something that doesn't cost, it has a real cost. And that real cost used to be recognised with mental health officer status, if, if you can remember that far back, because it's really tough to do that job, and that's why people ended up retiring much earlier in those professions than they did in other professions. We have to get that back. 
And the best way to get that back is to get people like you to come in and talk to our students. So I'm afraid you, you thought this was the only cause to speak. <laughs> no, this is a regular thing. Why not? Um, because you will be a role model for them. And uh, actually, they will aspire to do what you have done as well. But you can get your messages across mm. at the same time. That's the thing about communication, it's two way. Yeah. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. I think he's no. got, I think he had a bit of one for me as well. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you want me to answer as well, John? I'm sure you do. I know you too well. Um, what do we do at the women's? Well, we we do a lot of things. We've got a, a set of values which are about how we how we act and conduct ourselves. Uh, we recruit against those. We um, we appraise our staff and ask them um, how have they lived those values. Um, how can they demonstrate they've lived their, those values? Um, we do a whole raft of things. Helen, who, who asked the question earlier, is the Director of Nursing and Midwifery. But we do care rounds twice daily. So we go round and talk to all of our women and say, um, how's it going? We check everything's all right. We ask questions. The matrons also do care rounds. Helen and I do care rounds. I've been on Ward 7 and 8 today uh, and did a care round with Helen where we went round um, and met all of the women. And the conversation is, Hello, um, how's it going? Um, are you all right? Have, how are we looking after you? Have you had everything you need? Is the have we given you the right information? Do you have to call the nurse or does she come for you? Did she introduce herself? Uh, do you, are you in pain? Is there anything more we can do for you? Did you like your lunch? We do. <laughs> um, and we've got a whole raft of things that we're doing, which is um, one about, it is about seeing how we're doing, but it's also about modelling it. So it's our staff seeing people like me, like Helen, like Neil, who's here tonight, the Chief Operating Officer, like our non-executive directors, like our governors, going out and genuinely asking people, are you all right? And is there anything else you need? And have we done a good job? And if we haven't done a good job, what was wrong with it? And that's about role modelling it. And we've got a, a raft of things that we're, we're doing round like that. But it's, it's going to be an ongoing process and we don't get it right all the time. I skipped over the bit where people like Ros will come in to try and influence our programme design. But what we produce is the raw material that they mould and turn into the people who deliver care. So that influencing process is about making sure that we equip our students with the right skill sets to enable them to flourish whenever they end up getting a job within, within the clinical environment. So it's not we're paying lip service to this. We're, we're not asking people in just to say, oh, I think we should do a little more anatomy and physiology. It's much more about those core and softer skills. Um, that if they are going to be the key characteristics that the trusts are going to be looking for, then we need to build that into our curriculum. It's a live process, and it's one which ultimately, because we're working together, will result in a higher standard of care than, we, than, than maybe has been evident in the past. Care up to this point has been quite transactional. Mm. You go to the doctor for something, they give you something for your ailment, it's quite transactional. Care in other situations, in, in acute situations, in, in the secondary uh, care sector, is not necessarily transactional. An awful lot of it is about the kindness which people demonstrate, and that goes to improve the, um, the experience that those patients have. Mary Carswell's here today, she, she's PVC with responsibility for student satisfaction. The same thing that we have in terms of patient satisfaction, we have in student satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And it's about showing the students that we <coughs> care, showing the patients that we care. And that's what we're committed to, which is why we're doing things like this. The bulk of the people we're working with are already trained. And although we can shape new people as they come in, uh, they're only feeding into the system. We've got a big group of staff working in the NHS now. And we need to rapidly respond to the issues that have been raised. We can't say we're going to wait till this cohort of people have moved through and you and I are retired and uh, you know the, the new students are here. Um, so I, my, I suppose my, my view is that ultimately you ostracize them. You ultimately 
do it by actually deciding that this is the way we do round, round here and getting uh, the, the, the majority to start moving in that thing. You will get left with people who are very resistant but, and you'll have to drive them underground or out in the end. Um, but they'll have to feel that actually they've got to move with this because it's now no longer politically correct. Now, whether that's not the, an ideal solution, but it is where we'll need to get to, that actually we'll have to continuously think what is acceptable and what is not, in exactly the same way we do it, would if it was a technical clinical skill. If the technical clinical skill of a, a surgeon or a neonatologist in your case, if somebody wasn't doing technically, um, or a, a, an advanced nurse practitioner wasn't putting a line in, say, technically right, you wouldn't accept it. And we're going to have to do exactly the same with the other elements because they're non-negotiable. They're not something that we can strip out. Um, we can't just deliver technically excellent care. It's got to have these elements <coughs> in it as well. I don't think it encourages it, I don't think it, and the sorts of way they've tried to encourage it with the friends and family test, I think is an incredibly crude and inappropriate measure, and you know that because you've heard me say that. Um, so um, I don't think we've got our heads round it at all at the moment, uh, and as the pressure of the money and you know all about the money, um, gets worse. People are going to get more, you know, A&E waiting times, all those sorts of things. And the targets always go back to being the, the, the thing that be, can be most, you know, headline managed by the government. Um, and therefore, this will only change if there really is uh, an understanding from both the government and the department and whatever, that these things are important. And I don't, I don't, I think they say it. I don't think they mean it yet. Um, so we will have to do it regardless of the system because it's important for us as an organisation and that that's got to be our measures as a board um, in, and, and others about how do we measure that in a way that we at least feel we're doing that. Uh, because we won't be externally measured. We'll be measured on friends and family, but that's not, that's very, very crude and not really what we're looking for. The measures I get more, to be honest, are the care rounds and the sorts of things I get from the direct feedback from people is probably where I learn most.